The intersection between people and their technology is an omnipresent theme within works of the cyberpunk genre. Across some of the most formative stories in this vein, transhumanist tones have manifested in many forms, sculpting the ideas behind the cyberpunk world as much as they have the people therein. Narrative tropes like dynamic, generalized artificial intelligence and advanced travel, both spacefaring and terrestrial, are abound in many iterations of cyberpunk works. But perhaps the single most recognizable trait of the genre is the augmentation of both body and mind by way of advanced cybernetic technologies. To be sure, Mike Pondsmith's cyberpunk series leans into each of these tropes as well. Night City is positively filled with interesting dark future concepts, after all, not the least of which being that of human augmentation. Just about everywhere you turn in the world of cyberpunk, you're bound to find someone sporting one or more pieces of high-tech cyberware. But there has historically been one group who are perhaps the most consistently chromed up of them all, a terrifying gang of almost inhuman criminals bordering on cyberpsychosis, better known as Maelstrom. To many Cyberpunk 2077 players, V's interactions with Maelstrom will stand out as some of the most memorable moments in the entire game. It's hard to forget these guys, recognizable for the deeply invasive augmentations that replace vast swaths of their bodies, perhaps most prominently on the face. Maelstrom are undoubtedly on the leading edge of augmentation in 2077, but many may not be aware of the gang's turbulent history and just what led its members to adopt that Cyborgian appearance to begin with. That's right, today we're going to talk about one of Night City's most recognizable gangs, haunting the streets of cyberpunk since at least the 2020s, perpetually bordering on the very edge of cyberpsychosis. A story of violence, betrayal, and illegal business, this is the full history and lore of Maelstrom, cyberpunk's most heavily augmented gang. Before we really get going, I wanted to take a second to briefly describe one of the sources I've used most heavily in today's video, that being what is, at the time of recording, the newest supplementary source book to Cyberpunk Red, Danger Gal Dossier. The book serves as a faction and NPC guide containing reports collected by Michiko Arasaka's private investigation firm, all of which expand upon the lore of both individual characters and entire gangs from the time of the Red, while further fleshing out Danger Gal and the role they play in the year 2045. The reason that I wanted to bring the book to all of your attention, though, really stems from how new it is at the time of this video being uploaded, having only released in early August of 2023. Of course, I'll always be one to recommend checking out the original sources of information that I present within these videos, but I also just legitimately found this work to be a lot of fun to read. The way the information is delivered is just really engaging, while also being super lore-heavy and a damn good source book in its own right. This is definitely a work that I'm going to be coming back to in the future, and I guess, considering I had an excuse to reference it so extensively in this video, I thought I'd just put it on the radar of anyone who might not know about it yet so that you can give it a look. Anyway, with all that out of the way, let's talk about Maelstrom. Like many of Night City's gangs, such as the Mox and 2077's iteration of the Voodoo Boys, Maelstrom was a group born out of a desire for retribution. In order to understand the events that led to the creation of such a faction, though, it's essential that we have some context surrounding another group that existed before and during their own reign. The Inquisitors were a small faction active from sometime between 2013 and 2020, all the way up until at least 2045. The Inquis Inquisitors are most well known for their strict anti-cyberware doctrine, an ideology that had rapidly become quite archaic in the cyberpunk world, and one which likely contributed to the gang's seeming inability to consistently amass new members at the same rate as other organizations. Described as being just as much a cult as a gang, the Inquisitors considered themselves on a sort of crusade against the use of cyberware in any form, and were known to zealously lash out in violence against members 
members of opposing factions. Those who had the misfortune of running across these folks would often have their cyberware forcibly removed, and by the year 2020, just about every gang in Night City was united in the understanding that Inquisitor members were trouble. One such gang that no doubt spent their fair share of time fending off Inquisitor attacks was the Metal Warriors, a group for which very little is actually known. But one can infer that the gang was probably relatively young and small, since they were not mentioned in Cyberpunk's first edition sourcebook, which takes place in the year 2013, it seems fairly likely that the gang would have been less than a decade old around 2020. Additionally, it would also stand to reason that most or all of their members were equipped with some kind of cyberware. This would have probably classified the Metal Warriors as a booster gang, a subcategory of gang known for enhancing themselves with large amounts of cybernetics, though since the precise level of augmentation exhibited by the group is as of yet unknown, it's hard to say entirely whether or not this was the case. Regardless, even one cybernetic each would have been enough to draw the ire of the Inquisitors, and one fateful night, the cultish clan would launch an attack on the group. Nearly every member of the Metal Warriors was killed in this altercation, leaving the remaining few scrambling, and in the process, brought an abrupt end to this unsung gang. At least in name, the Metal Warriors would never recover, and left to just a handful of former members who had escaped the attack or were otherwise spared in some way, an unparalleled resentment toward the Inquisitors would emerge. Those left alive in the wake of the massacre would build themselves back up, and create a new gang, one antithetical to the Inquisitors in every regard. It was around this sentiment that Maelstrom would be formed. By the year 2020, Maelstrom had already solidified themselves as a prominent force. Their notoriety had grown so much, in fact, that a description of the faction was available on publicly accessible data terms throughout the city. Cyberpunk 2020's Night City sourcebook is written in such a way as to represent one such data term, and as a result, readers are granted a look into the characterization of Maelstrom during this era. This combat gang was formed around the remnants of the Metal Warriors, a gang virtually wiped out in one night by the Inquisitors. It has since drafted members of the Red Cross Chrome Legion and Iron Sights, who have violent personal grudges against the Inquisitors, although other targets are randomly savaged as well. Members dress in the traditional black leather and chrome, sport visible cyberware, and simply look dirty, primitive, and dangerous. Maelstrom's leader, Hammer, was originally thrown out of the Metal Warriors for breaking their combat code. Now, anything goes. About 30% of the gang are registered cyber psychos, and another 35% are hovering near the edge. If you're being chased by Inquisitors, you might be glad to see these guys, but that's the only time. Recently, Maelstrom has taken over the deserted building that used to be Barley's, on the west side of town near the docks. They have made this area their turf, but the situation is volatile at best, because of the large number of businesses in the area serving the covert needs of corpse and solos. The gang is bright enough to realize this, and choose the targets of their business security charge visits quite carefully. Observers still can't understand why Maelstrom has never put the squeeze on the three elderly ladies who run on R, D, and F floral creations. Other than nighttime sweeps for Inquisitors, the gang is into small-time crimes, but a need for new cyberware and combat drugs threatens to drive them to hit larger targets, like Guevara's, the Mexican restaurant where weapons are dealt out the back door. If this happens, expect a bloodbath, as the professionals are pitted against the cyber psychos for the best two out of three. There are a few aspects of this testimony that offer some deeper insight into the state of Maelstrom even in these early years. The first comes from their new recruits. Aside from the survivors of the Metal Warriors, there are two gangs named in the account as being primary sources for providing Maelstrom with new members, the Red Chrome Legion and Iron Sights. And to put it bluntly, both of these gangs are, or at least were, some of the most dangerous factions Night City had to offer. The former were just pretty bad people. Being a radical hate group is abhorrent enough without being souped up on cybernetics and drugs. As for Iron Sights, though, they were a gang once bankrolled by Arasaka, at least until a report conducted by the Corp discovered that, according to them, every member of the gang was exhibiting cyberpsychosis, so they severed ties. 
Perhaps the best characterization of Maelstrom, though, can be seen in their boss, Hammer. As alluded to in Danger Gal Dossier, Hammer was actually the group's founder, and though he was shunned from the Metal Warriors as previously stated, it would stand to reason that the collapse of the gang would have reunited him with his former comrades, or at least however many of them had survived. Symbolically, it would seem that his leadership itself came to embody the radically anti-Inquisitor sentiment that had come to characterize the group. While the Inquisitors opposed cyberware of any kind, Maelstrom adopted widespread use of only the most prominent cybernetics. Obvious and garish pieces of machinery that would fundamentally change how the vast majority of the body would look. While the Inquisitors adopted a mindset that idealized humanity in its natural state, Maelstrom pushed those ideals to their logical extreme, adopting a primal, warlike, and animalistic attitude. It's no understatement to suggest that for every aspect that could be used to describe the Inquisitors, the inverse could be said of Maelstrom. It's hard to say whether some of these parallels are even intended in Maelstrom's design, but nevertheless, I mean, they fit together thematically quite well. Maelstrom's territory at the time, as mentioned previously, was situated near the docks, and here they adopted their long-running habit of squatting within abandoned facilities. Most of the gang's operations would work out of such locales even into the year 2077, likely due to a combination of advantages the gang saw in abandoned property. Between the lack of any sort of paper trail and the relative secrecy offered in squatting as opposed to an above-board arrangement, these dens would quickly become hubs for storing, moving, and hiding the contraband through which the gang earned a lion's share of their revenue. As revealed previously, the building formerly hosting Barley's would serve as Maelstrom's den for a time, but it's said that there was another, more lively place that the group often thought of as their second home, the Burleson Tower Hotel, and more specifically, the infamous bar at the Tower's Peak. As it happens, the Night City Sourcebook has a section all about this building and its significance to the boost gangs of 2020, so I'll read that aloud now. Burleson Construction Company was in charge of a lot of the construction in downtown Night City, and went bankrupt shortly after mob businesses took over. The mob left the building standing and the name unchanged as a monument to their victory. Poor maintenance has resulted in the slow deterioration of this building, which has finally ended up as a hotel. The rates are high, for despite the condition of the building, it's convenient to the city center, corporate center, and financial district. There are also a number of joy girls working the hotel, and there's a massage parlor operating on the third floor. The top three floors of the building are occupied by Totentans, a poorly supervised club where a lot of booster gang members go to work up some adrenaline before getting laid. The music is loud the drinks strong, and the patrons rowdy to an extreme. The local ambulance companies no longer make runs here because too many of the casualties of this club couldn't pay their bills. Late at night, groups of booster gangers will make trips to Metacross Preservation on High Street near Sterling to finance their next round of drinks. The NCPD lets Totentans stay open for two reasons. One, it kills the punks, and two, the gangs would get very upset if the place got closed down. Of all the booster gangs which frequented the Totentans during this time, though, there can be no doubt that Maelstrom was by far the most attached to the place. Indeed, there's definitely a sense of significance or reverence expressed between Maelstrom and the Totentans even now that's a bit hard to put into words. To call it a sort of fondness is perhaps a bit too prosaic, but there can be no doubt that this establishment was a favorite hangout for the group, and certainly one which they had a more personal relationship with than any of the other areas they've frequented before or since. It may at this point become evident just how far Maelstrom had come since their humble beginnings. Though their predecessors, the Metal Warriors, may have folded under the threat posed by the Inquisitors, Maelstrom had grown into a force that was almost certainly the more powerful and deadly of the two. After all, while Maelstrom holds a place amongst the most prominent factions mentioned in the Night City sourcebook, the Inquisitors have only one paragraph to call their own in a section titled The Smaller Gangs. And then came the fourth corporate war, and with it, the AHQ disaster. 
Yep, even Maelstrom didn't escape the darkest day in cyberpunk history unfazed. The damages came as a direct result of the nuclear detonation within Arasaka Tower. Any territory that the gang had claimed or built up outside of their home base was lost from either the explosion itself or in the fires that were soon to follow. Much to the gang's dismay, not even the Totentans was spared, suffering considerable damage, though fortunately not being a total loss. As it turns out, it was rather miraculous that the gang themselves were spared at all, with a single condo building standing between their hideout and the full fury of the blast. However, in a phenomenon that's not fully understood, many of the most heavily augmented members of the group would fall into inexplicable cyberpsychosis-esque madness just after the explosion, thus attributing many maelstrom deaths to the disaster one way or another. And one of these deaths was actually none other than Hammer himself. Retrospectively, this moment was, in many ways, a mirror to the initial circumstances that had given rise to the group years prior. Infrastructure was destroyed, Maelstrom members were killed and driven mad in the fires and the fallout, but they were stronger now. The gang would not disband, they would not bend the knee to circumstance as they had with the Inquisitors. No, in Night City, it's tribulations like these that separate the has-beens from the legends. This was, if anything, an opportunity for the gang to gain control of more resources and influence than ever before, and under a new leader, that chance would not be squandered. Years later, in the Time of the Red, an account of that new leader, whose name was Crusher, would be summarized by Danger Gal member Linda Overpass Lucastra, and it's because of this testimony that we know what happened in the years to follow the disaster. Crusher became Maelstrom's leader when its founder, Hammer, died in the gang's nuke frenzy after Arasaka Tower fell. He rallied the gang's survivors to fight through the wreckage of the burning city to the Burlesen Tower Hotel and Totentans. He dueled the Warrior Hearts gang leader for the hotel floors that serve as Maelstrom's headquarters today. He and other survivors stabilized the Totentans' structure with rubble and salvaged construction gear. Maelstrom held the building against looters, end-of-the-world types, and even soldiers from various sides. Often, Crusher headed the charge. With all his cyberware still working, he was one of the most dangerous people in the city. But something broke in Crusher as the city burned. In 2027, during a cyber-psychotic episode, he slaughtered a Stormtech convoy and disappeared into the hot zone. Since then, he's made seemingly random reappearances, like the gang's personal angry god. Sometimes it's to join Maelstrom's battles. Sometimes it's to beat down the gang's current members while cryptically ranting. I can't figure out how he dodges Maxtac, let alone where he vanishes. Wherever it is must have spare parts. Indeed, as the years rolled by, Crusher would become something of a cryptid in and around the exclusion zone. By the year 2045, it doesn't seem like anyone is completely sure what's happened to him, but apparently he was, or is, still out there somewhere. Either way, though, he had successfully led the gang back to the Totentans, viewed by this point as their rightful homeland. Now, all that was left was to re-elect a leader, and to rebuild. Hextra was the name of the gang's next boss, and by this point, the Burlesen Tower and the Totentans would have almost certainly been in the process of revitalization. With the old hangout back in working order, and under Maelstrom's authority for the first time, it would gradually become a popular attraction for Night City's criminal under underworld once again. As for the rest of the building, aside from the old bar, Maelstrom would not delay in repurposing it to serve their own needs. What was once a ballroom became a meeting space and a hub for higher-ups, and fittingly enough, the body of their founder, Hammer, came to rest here as well. Maelstrom had also grown pretty accustomed to skirting the edge of the hot zone by this time. Therefore, it was probably around this era when members of the group would begin to pioneer a whole new type of crime, or or at least a wholly questionable new source of income. They were among the first with the intelligence, or lack thereof, to see opportunity in the act of salvaging valuables directly out of the radioactive hole that now made up the old city and corporate center, an endeavor that seems to have actually yielded significant results. Throughout the time of the Red, Maelstrom would retain an iron grip on this market, aided by low-level scavs who were willing to do the dangerous work on the gang's behalf. 
primarily for the social and financial benefits therein. It's difficult to say whether this practice was at all refined and whether or not it was seeing any form of mass adoption in the clan during the time of Hextra's reign though, since all signs point to her not being around for that long. After her death at the hands of Maxtac, the future of Maelstrom would pass over to their fourth leader, Warlock, who's said to be the one to have galvanized the clan, molding them into the almost industrially efficient Maelstrom of the late 2040s. Warlock looks like a typical disposable ganger chump at first glance, to the point of being mistaken for muscle occasionally at meetings. Yet, he wields a surprising range of knowledge, social awareness, and presence effectively to drive his agenda and win deals even with corporate agents. Meanwhile, his foot soldiers build the gang's reputation for messy hyperviolence and creepy rituals. Warlock organized the wannabes who hung around Totentans into one of the best scav forces working the hot zone. He consolidated the gang's grasp on Totentans as well. Every booster gang is still welcome, in the same come-get-stabbed sense as always, but Maelstrom literally keeps the building standing. Warlock purposefully makes Maelstrom look chaotic from outside, but his core team operate methodically, enacting his long-term plans. If Warlock lasts, Maelstrom could wield real power in Night City. Despite the great lengths to which it seems Maelstrom went in order to preserve the original Burlesen Tower and the Totentans, it was eventually decided that the bar needed to be moved, since the tower itself was still in foundational disrepair, in spite of its continued use. In hopes of relocating the establishment before another disaster in the form of the hotel's collapse, Flenser, one of Warlock's lieutenants, would oversee a search for a suitable replacement location. It's insinuated that the area eventually settled upon by the gang is the very same abandoned hotel found to house the Totentans Club in Cyberpunk 2077. As time went on, the hot zone would become less and less dangerous for everyday people, until eventually the area would be built over, and the residents of Night City would more or less move on from the events of the AHQ disaster. Sometime during the next three or so decades to follow 2045 though, Warlock would be succeeded by Declan Griffin, better known as Brick, the first of Maelstrom's leaders to sport the now iconic red-eyed faceplate model of cyberware. This look would be adopted by the vast majority of Maelstrom members moving forward. Regardless, many years would go by before the next chronicled Maelstrom activity. It wouldn't be until 2076 when Maelstrom gang members scuffled with the Edge Runner crew headed by Maine, and later by David Martinez. And so, we get our first real look at the current state of the group, a state largely considered to be stronger than at any other time in their history. In their ever-unfolding search to acquire more and more technically advanced cyberware, the group had taken to hitting convoys operated by the Megacorps, and it was actually as a result of one of these hits that they would acquire the Militech MTO D12 Flathead. This small machine was nothing less than a state-of-the-art art reconnaissance robot. The main appeal of the flathead was, of course, its cloaking mechanism, as well as its neural interface. But there were a lot more technologically advanced features incorporated into its design that ensured it would be a sought-after piece of tech for anyone interested in reconnaissance. Fucking tricked out this thing. Dynamic thermal optic camo armor. Full cognitive immersion with a Raven controller. Pinned out prototype actuators made of titanium vanadium Kevlar composite. And watch this! Fully integrated link too, so when the spider starts crawling up walls dangling from ceilings. Mm hmm. Could lose your lunch. This thing was top tier and it wouldn't be long until one Dexter Deshawn would approach Maelstrom in the interest of purchasing it in the year 2077. It was to be used in a heist of his own design, a plan to steal a certain biochip from Arasaka. Originally, Brick had agreed to the deal, but by the time V and Jackie Wells were prepared to embark to the abandoned All Foods plant that the gang controlled, Brick had actually been deposed as leader by Simon Randall 
also called Royce. Though many assumed that Brick had been killed during this confrontation, he was, in actuality, kept within a cell in the All Foods plant. And here, we reach the point in our tale where the future becomes dependent. The pickup involving the Flathead can go a number of different ways, and as it happens, this mission sets into motion one of the more extensive decision trees Cyberpunk 2077 has to offer, albeit that each of the choices are relatively inconsequential to the greater narrative of the game. What would otherwise be a simple two-way decision is made complicated by Meredith Stout, a Militech Corpo officer who had an interest in pursuing Maelstrom over her company's stolen property. If encountered, she'll offer V a loaded cred chip, which can be used as a bargaining piece with Maelstrom later on, though the choice to accept or decline the chip is ultimately V's to make. It has, however, been equipped with a virus, so if they accept and have the skills to do so, there's another choice in whether or not they remove the malware before continuing. Once meeting with Royce and the other Maelstrom members present at the All Foods, though, it becomes apparent that Royce isn't as willing to part with the flathead as Brick was and tries to shake down V and Jackie in order to be paid for the device a second time, despite Dexter having already forwarded the funds in their previous engagement. Although there are a variety of circumstances which can lead to each outcome here, there's essentially three ways that this conversation can end. If V never talked with Meredith and is complacent, using their own money to pay for the flathead, then the deal concludes just like that, and V and Jackie are allowed to leave without violence. All right. Better show you guys how. What the hell for? We know the way. Easy, compadre. You'll be outside in no time. Get in. Aside from this one variation, though, every other option results in our main character being forced to pick sides, either with Militech or with Maelstrom. In each path in which they ally themselves against the Booster Gang, though, Royce will be killed either by V themselves or off-screen by Militech, leading either to the reinstating of Brick as leader, should he be freed from his capture, or to the promotion of a new boss, Ophelia Patricia Sirawayan. Should V side with Maelstrom, though, then they and the gang will team up together in order to fend off Militech from the All Foods, and later in the game, V can actually meet with Royce at the Totentans. In many ways, it could be argued that allying with Maelstrom is sort of the good ending to their story, though it's worth noting that each scenario provides V with a different iconic weapon. This dynamic of choice is also unique, given that it's the only point in the game where a player must specifically lock themselves out of earning one weapon in order to achieve the other. In some capacity, I think that that choice in and of itself is indicative of what Maelstrom's all about. To many, the preferable option lies in which gear you would rather have, morality or consistency be damned. And if that's not in the spirit of the gang, I don't really know what is. I honestly don't have a lot to say about Maelstrom in terms of my usual analysis at the ends of these videos. I don't have any symbolism or perceived narrative nuances to share with you today before we wrap things up. But with a group as unpredictable as this one is, I think that's hardly a surprise. Instead, I want to leave you with this. As we've seen today, Maelstrom more or less tends toward a cyclical way of being, observable on both a micro and macro scale. Individually, it's in a Maelstromer's nature to perform crime in order to afford more cyberware, and that cyberware, in turn, enabling for yet more crime. On the whole, though, I think that a similar pattern can be observed. Maelstrom built up from virtually nothing, likely surpassing the Metal Warriors at their height, only to be reduced to the edge of ruin once again during the AHQ disaster. And a similar cycle of setbacks and leaps forward can be observed under the direction of every major leader since. Under Crusher, they retook control of their territory and gained power over the Totentans. With Warlock, the gang took full advantage of the Hot Zone, but in highlighting this cycle, it becomes apparent that Maelstrom is currently enjoying a relative time of peace. Given Cyberpunk 2077's branching story, it's tough to know where the gang is headed in the future, but if I were to guess, I would say that one of these leaders, Brick, Royce, or Patricia, is going to have to be the one to step up to the plate whenever the next wave of hardship decides to fall upon Maelstrom next. Regardless of what happens, though, it'll be of great interest to see how this group of near-cyber-psychos weather the next inevitable storm. 
And that brings us to the end of yet another video. Thank you for joining me today as we explored the lore and history of Maelstrom, no doubt one of Cyberpunk's most recognizable factions, and as I hope you found today, quite an interesting one at that. I want to thank my good friend Bart for assisting in research for this video's topic, and from the bottom of both of our hearts, we really do want to thank you guys for watching. At the risk of sounding somewhat stereotypical here, the channel has been undergoing a lot of growth of late, and I just wanted to let you guys know how thankful I am for that and how exciting it is to see. Not only did I want to thank everyone old and new to the channel for showing such overwhelming support, but I also wanted to assure you that I've been putting a lot of thought into how I can continue to make the channel and the viewing experience even better. I've been buying and upgrading some equipment with the ad revenue that some of the recent videos have been generating, and it really is my hope that that not only will that equipment help to make the videos that I put out a little bit better, but also that I can produce content a little bit more consistently. I hope you look forward to that, I certainly am, and once again, I want to thank folks for taking a chance on the channel, and hopefully you're enjoying what you're seeing here. Also, it's more likely than not that the next Cyberpunk lore video that I upload here will be coming out post-Phantom Liberty, which is very exciting. I'm really looking forward to it, and if you are as well, then be sure to subscribe so that you guys can be notified when I drop my first videos about it. Once again, thank you so much for the support. Uh, it means a hell of a lot, and I appreciate all of the likes and insightful comments and speculation that always proceed each and every video upload. Those are always a ton of fun for me to read, and I look forward to seeing more as we move into the future. Anyway, that's going to do it for today. This is Averberon. I'll see you again soon, and have a good one.